Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Edge 2014. Brought to you by IBM. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone, live in Las Vegas for IBM Edge. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Joined my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is in the trenches, making it happen. Uh, we love talking to customers. Uh, Brendan McCauley, Executive Director, IT Service Operations, Heartland Payment Systems. Welcome to theCUBE. Well, thank you very much. So the uh, thing I want to get to right away is we love talking to the uh, customers out there. Share with the folks out there, uh, just, just to kick this off, What's going on in IT? I mean, like, operations are critical. You know, Dave and I always joke about 70% of the money spent to keep the lights on and, and the rest is for innovation. That's kind of flipping around the other way with the cloud, with DevOps, software-defined data center, with all the refresh going on, certainly with virtualization, there's, there's a reset going on. So talk about, in a big picture, what is some of that reset? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, we have, uh, in the last five years, seen IT budgets be fairly flat, but at the same time, explosive growth and really the challenge has been uh, taking infrastructure that was very siloed, very purpose built for a specific product group or a specific, a specific business unit and uh, really get building in some more flexibility into a true multi-tenancy environment with a you know, real IO blender and it's become a lot more unpredictable. So you used to have these waterfall de development cycles, now you have Edel Scrum and DevOps and you know, really iterative approaches, failing faster, all those kinds of t uh, cliches, if you will. But the at the lean end of the startup, the lean IT department. Absolutely. So you've got you've got really got this kind of uh, these competing interests. You know, you got this old you know this old stodgy way of doing IT, and then this new startup kind of thing. And you know, you're competing with the likes of likes of Amazon for. Well, rapid I got to ask you two questions. The mindset issue is one. I want to get the cultural question. But a lot of the young talent coming in, they don't want to load Linux patches. Right. You know, they don't want to rack and stack gear. Absolutely. So you have a cultural shift with the new generation coming on board, this modern era. And also you have a cultural issue on the legacy <laughs> IT department. Talk about that. What does the collision course look like? What are some of the things that you've seen that work and don't work in that environment? How do people break through that? How do they transform to get there? You know, I think, I think a lot of co companies that, that have been around for a while, like Heartland, uh, face that same issue. So basically, um, what we've seen and really the wins we've had for uh, merging older applications and you know, maybe some past thought process with some, some those newer challenges where people don't want to do those rote uh, manual things you know, for on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, automation's really helped a lot with that, so um, building in a whole lot of orchestration and automation and uh, those are self-funding activities at many times and really what we what we found is immersing uh, newer talent uh, with, with uh, in employees that have been in IT for a long time uh, and building those wins around automation, it gets everybody out of doing the mundane. So you are talking about the 70% the keeping lights on and 30% for innovation. You know, automation, I think, has really been key for us to basically say, you know, we're, all, we're always growing. We've, we've, our inf server infrastructure, for, ex for example, has grown by a factor of 20 in the last five years. Our staff hasn't grown by a factor of 20 in the last five years, so there's more and more stuff to do. And once you get everybody in the mindset of, you know, let's automate the mundane so we have more time to be innovative and, and, and do the more exciting, uh, uh, exciting tasks and add new business value to Heartland, it, you know, it sends the message that it keeps IT relevant, it keeps IT part of the solution, and um, it really, it really also helps make uh, make uh, administrators' lives easier. You know, they're not up at all hours of the night patching, like you mentioned, um, or early in the morning. And uh, it also improves quality too. So you know, you, you start to eliminate a lot of the human error, and uh, you get instead of administrators, you get engineers, you get automators. You are know? you moving that seventy thirty needle? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, we are for sure 
we're, you know, we're not there yet. So we're not, we're not at 70-30 innovation by any means, but we're getting closer and closer to 50-50, which I think is a heck of a lot of progress. Um, yeah. You know, when I, when, I was at Har when I started at Heartland about five years ago, really the number was about 80-20, you know, 80% keeping the lights on, 20% innovation, and we've really moved the needle quite a bit in that area. Talk, talk a little bit more about Heartland. Maybe talk about your business and what's driving things. Yeah, so uh, Heartland Payment Systems is the fifth largest credit card processor in the United States, and, and that's always been the leading statement for Heartland. I mean, that is our legacy uh, bread and butter application. So five years ago, that was about 90% of our revenue. And today, it's about 60% of our revenue. So that's a really interesting. We are, uh, we are big believers in penetrating new markets and acquiring companies that are creative to our operating margins or co have complementary product offerings and complementary markets. Uh, we, we are in the, like I said, we're in the credit card authorization space, but we do uh, debit card processing, gift and loyalty, payroll, um, school solutions like the ID card where you can load money onto it, student loan processing, and those, those applications uh, make up another 40% of our revenue. And the real challenge there has been, it's been eye-opening for IT because you, when you build IT for a certain kind of product line and then you start getting into a diversified portfolio, it introduces a lot of new challenges about mixed workload and unpredictability. Um, and then you've got things like DevOps, like I, like I talked earlier, where you're learning to fail faster and you're doing this, taking this iterative, iterative approach to not only development, but also uh, application and product offerings. So if you, you experiment, um, that really puts new challenges in your, your infrastructure. So you got acquisitions going on and you got new products that you're supporting. Have you been able to, I wonder if you could talk about your infrastructure a little bit. You know, with Tom Rosamilia, infrastructure matters, um, especially when it breaks. Absolutely. <laughs> um, why don't we talk a little bit about, have you been able to, let's talk about historically IT, and not even historically, today. It's mostly in silos. You came out of, uh, I think, the storage world, right? And then now you're managing the entire infrastructure operations, right? So you have your storage silos, your compute silos, your networking silos. Um, and generally applications are purpose, you know, have infrastructure that's purpose built to support them. Right. Have you been able to build a more sort of horizontal platform, infrastructure platform to support these emerging applications, to support acquisitions and the like? I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny you say platform infrastructure. That's actually the name of our infrastructure oh. team now. Uh, it used to be uh, Windows administration and AIX administration, and it is as siloed as you could imagine. So it, the storage administration, VMware administration, network administration, firewall administration, all those teams are gone, and now we have a platform infrastructure team, and we have infrastructure engineers that are much more integrators now, instead of subject matter experts, rocket scientists on a certain kind of silo. That real, that siloed view really kind of breaks down when you start to get to rapid infrastructure delivery and rapid application delivery. and. Uh, Really, our, our infrastructure team, I'm really proud of them. They, they've really changed their mindset. They, they understand that the, the name of the game isn't knowing some kind of piece of technology as well as possible. It's really, uh, it's really delivering value to the business and uh, bringing transparency, good monitoring, rapid infrastructure delivery to, to market. That's really what's important. That's what our customers are asking for. So how did you achieve that? Maybe you could talk about that. Um, and I mean, you don't just sit, wake up one day and say, okay, we're going to change the whole organization and we're going to change the, the infrastructure. Maybe talk us through the journey that you took there. Yeah, the journey there was really uh, started with virtualization back in 09. I mean, we, we, really, uh, we really invested in VMware heavily. Um, that really helped us on the, the, the x86 side, you know, Windows and Linux. Uh, uh, infrastructure delivery, so we got some wins there on, hey, we can be a little bit more responsive. And it contributed to your server growth, I presume. It sure did, it sure did, and it created some new challenges. That actually created a massive storage challenge and massive network challenges, and so um, starting in about, I think it was about 2011, we, we booted out our incumbent uh, purpose-built storage provider, I won't name names, but we, and we, we changed to uh, IBM XIV platform, and really the, what allured me there was the approachability of administration. So basically that technology is all about delivering value to the business quickly. So when you're doing things like you know, provisioning out LUNs to VMware or to physical systems, that you're, you're not, it's not a road exercise in just babysitting technology. You're, you're, really, you're really getting what you need to get done, accomplished fast, and uh, really letting the, the technology you know, take, take a, man, a process that takes minutes or you know, hours down to just minutes or seconds and also really providing a lot of transparency on monitoring. So uh, the XIV is all about simplicity. So I look at it as the consumerization of IT and infrastructure. So it's basically, I, I like to refer to an XIV as kind of like an iPod of Sans. You know, it's, you know what you're getting, 
There are no hot spots, there are no surprises, and they're, it's really easy to, uh, to manage. And that, so we started with, with the Windows and, and Red Hat virtualization, and then we went to storage and we said, now we've got server, server delivery fast with virtualization, and we've got storage delivery fast with the XIV, and that started giving us some clout in, in the company to say, you know what, We're, we, are, we are getting more nimble. And that really progressed down to the, the network environment, our firewall environment, and, and it's still, we're still working on it, but all, all phases of our infrastructure delivery now are, are accelerating and are getting much simpler, um, and also more, more predictable from a uh, user experience perspective. Brandon, so, I got to ask you the DevOps, because I'm fascinated by the innovation. Going from 80%, keeping the lights on, 20% innovation at 50-50 is a huge task. Obviously the comments on Twitter are already coming in on that. Fantastic stuff. Um, DevOps really is the culture. You, asked, you answered that earlier. But I got to ask you about automation, orchestration. These are operational things that create uh, reduce things, mundane tasks, allow you to free up to work on some creative stuff. So I want to ask you about automation and orchestration mm -hmm. at the ops level, and then the pressure you're getting, if any, or the drivers from the app developers, because at the end of the day, people just don't wake up and say, hey, let's do some DevOps. There's some other forces at work there. Is it the applications, and how is that working? Yeah, so DevOps, is, it's interesting. Yeah, more and more what we're seeing is developers Going back to the consumerization of IT, you're, you're, they're expecting the same kind of experience that they'd get from Amazon, but also with best of breed infrastructure that they could get from our infrastructure teams at Heartland Payment Systems. And the, the best way to really make an application work well from an operations standpoint is to have the infrastructure and the operations teams uh, there at design time for, for an application. That's where DevOps comes in, right? So in the past, operations and infrastructure is just an afterthought, right? So give me some servers, operations guys, go, and then go away, and then when it's time for this thing to go to market, you know, come in and you guys can monitor it and have a nice day. And what really you really see there is that applications fall on their face when, when, that, when that's the model, right? So it, you're not setting yourself up for success. And DevOps, it's really taking those runtime considerations of monitoring, measuring, health, scalability, Recoverability, so you know HADR, self-repairing, uh, self-repairing systems, it, uh, and, and applications. You know it's really taking those considerations into account at design time, and uh, you know we're we're somewhat neophytes in that still. You know it's a, it's a work it's in still progress. Early, though. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but we've got everybody drinking the Kool Aid. We've got some operational. Uh, so we've got a set of uh, ten commandments uh, from operational values at Heartland. And those are development guidelines. So they're not just operation, they're not for the operations teams, those are for developers as well. So, I mean, you, you described that, that applications fall down when you do that, and it's if, if my understanding in talking to organizations who have made the move or are beginning to make the move is that because when you go to deploy, it, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, or it's not backed up, or it doesn't fit the edicts of the D, DR and right. HA strategy, so the operations guys start hacking it, and then they break it. Yep. They won't maybe admit that. Then they send it back to the apps guys, say, hey, your application doesn't work. They say, that's because you messed it up and you get this finger pointing going on. So how did you resolve that? A lot of guys come at it from, John calls it ops dev, mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like you guys are more coming at it from, from dev ops. It's an application centric skill set that you're driving. Is that right? And how did that affect the operations guys, were they, was it a training regimen that you had to put them through, or what yeah, are you doing? I mean, I, mean I, I, would, I would really, you know, it's interesting, uh, I, I would call it ops dev. I mean, in the past, that's, that's the way we've approached it, but what, uh, it's, it's, again, building that kind of clout like we've done with, you know, the servers, and then the storage, and then the network, and, you know, the, the rest of the infrastructure, building that clout of we can build a best of breed, scalable infrastructure. Um, my, that, my, uh, my career has gone from infrastructure now into operations, and I manage the infrastructure teams as well, um, but it's basically one voice on the ops side of DevOps, uh, you know, one, one team in operations, including infrastructure, helping build, helping build best of breed applications with the development teams. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Do you, do yeah, you yeah, feel, absolutely. Do you so, feel like you're running for mayor when you have to organize and herd the cats in DevOps? Or do you get to a point where it's kind of a, you know, it's a cultural thing where there's some norms that are formed. Take us through some of that. And what, what did you learn? What bumps have you kind of overcome? And, Absolutely. How did you resolve that? You know, I, I felt like I was running for mayor for about the first nine months or so, but uh, it's great. Uh, th there's a lot of good leaders behind me, and uh, 
in the development environments and in operations and in infrastructure. It's not that, a hard sell, basically. Yeah, they're having meetings without me. You know, it's it's you know I'm not you know and and they're really uh, the greatest thing is some of our applications that are even the most legacy applications we have. We have developers, uh, we we have leaders of the development teams getting with our operations guys and getting with our infrastructure guys and really figuring out you know let's throw all of our assumptions around the app, the architecture of this application out the window and how do we how do we repurpose this application with DevOps in mind and how do we, you know, these operations and development teams used to be really, really separated and now they're talking more than ever and they're really, they're really saying, you know what, how do we fix it? How do we kind of accept the sins of the past and fix them and, and really take this application that's had, that's had issues and had, had problems growing and really scale it for the future. Are you, are you uh, using any flash? I'm switching subjects, but while I have you, I'd love Yeah, to so uh, we are POCing, so uh, a couple of great leaders on our team uh, at Heartland and, uh, on the infrastructure and operations side, we've, we've, we've done a bake off of several flash systems uh, over, the last, flash over the last six months. And, uh, uh, we are we are doing a try and buy on the Flash System A40 right now, and we love it. I mean, it's how I'm much not is big for IBM, but it's, it's, so it's, it's the best thing we've had. Database we've had. app. Uh, yeah, so it's a multi-purpose uh, VMware data stores and database-driven apps. App, absolutely. Okay. So. How about big data? Is that infiltrated the ops yet? In terms of, uh, is it Hadoop? Is it purpose-built? Is it off the shelf? Yeah, right now it's purpose-built. It's an appliance, uh, so we we use uh, pure data. Yeah, so that so uh, we have a, a former Netiza pure data system, and uh, it's. it's it's gone really well. We have uh, SQL-based uh, data warehouses that aren't going away just because it, you know the, the transactional. Migration, yeah, yeah, exactly. Transactional and and the migration strategy for the, for those are pretty pretty. And for the low on the on the low latency, more big data, cost per gigabyte, more throughput. Do you use a different system for that? Um, not really. So uh, so Flash comes to you know. So what, what we're looking to do actually is uh, really virtualize our SAN environment. So really, at the end of the day, big data, you're you're bound by I/O, right? You're bound by latency. And uh, what we're looking to do is virtualize our SAN environment. So we we standardized on XIV for a long time. So we used to we used to run a, we used to be a, a not non IBM storage environment, and then we moved to IBM XIV, and it was kind of a cookie cutter XIV environment. So where we had just multiple XIVs, and what we found is that there are workloads like big data and um, just high high uh, high high I/O low latency environments like some very specialized OLTP mm -hmm. and and definitely some big analysis environments that needed something faster than an XIV. And that's where like, things like the Flash System 840 and SVCs and multi-tier can come to mind. So what we want to do is we don't want to just, uh, we don't want to just buy an 840 and put everything on it. Um, we do want to virtualize our data center as much as possible. So our strategy was to just ex expose all of our XIVs and flash systems as data stores in VMware and let VMware do that. But actually, there are there's software out there, such as uh, the virtual storage center from IBM and the SVC, that will do that a lot more, uh, a lot better than we can do as humans, right? Mm -hmm. So let the let the let the computers do that and and really drive up the efficiency and the usage of our of our flash system 840 and deliver better value for us. So that sounds like a step towards software defined and yeah. automation. But you know, you hear obviously everybody's marketing and pushing software defined. The challenge is you got a lot of stuff that works today and it's rich data services. You mm -hmm. talked about XIV, you talked about SVC. Um, the data services that are, exist there today are probably much more mature than you're going to get with some software running a bunch of commodity disks. So what's your take as a practitioner um, around software defined and then we got to wrap. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, software defined should be around automation and orchestration and the um, basically adding value added services on top of really high performance hardware. So I don't think you can just say, we're going to take a bunch of commodity disks and, and make a software defined uh, environment. At least I don't think that's, it's there yet. So um, I look, and, I, and I, I think that way around servers, and I think that way around servers, not, some, not as much, but definitely around networking like SDN. Um, you, you need a high performance infrastructure and lay intelligent software on top of it, in my opinion, because nothing's going to speed, beat the speed of ASICs, right? So, yeah, right. Um, and in Flash, right? I mean, you, 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 you need purpose-built Flash. I mean, uh, Flash is not Flash, right? There are a lot of different Flash vendors in the market, and some of them are more like around MLC. I mean, not to get too techy here, right? You know, you've got your, your commodity SSDs, and you've got some MLC, and then you have things that are faster, and there's a huge difference in performance. And I think uh, when you, when it, when you're looking at a multi-purpose, multi-tenant environment like your, you know, a private cloud, you know, let's use the cliche. Um, if you just, 
If you just make something a cloud, you put or automation orchestration on top of a poor infrastructure, you're cloud washing. I like to call it delivering poor infrastructure faster, and yeah. that's not really the business yeah. that we're in. We want to deliver best of breed infrastructure and say, you know, we can deliver infrastructure nearly as fast as Amazon or as fast as Amazon, but you're not getting 50 millisecond latency, you're getting sub millisecond latency. You're getting, you're getting the infrastructure that you've come to expect you know, working with it, work, working inside a Heartland payment systems uh, infrastructure. And I can check the box on my edicts on compliance and security. Absolutely, and else yeah. fits those, my those model. things are yeah. very, very yeah. important to us. Brandon, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I really want to uh, give you the last word here for the folks out there. It's been a great informative segment. Share with the folks out there who are on a journey to try to get 50-50 and actually get more innovation. What roadmap can you share with them? What direction, what best practice can you share the folks out there on how to get there? Yeah, I think what you need to do is, is when you're optimizing delivery of infrastructure or optimizing operations, find the, find the largest place that, the, that there's room for improvement. And those, those activities are, are definitely uh, self-funding. There's challenges in, in the IT industry with flat budgets or shrinking budgets. Um, you know, obviously with a flat IT budget, um, labor costs keep in, uh, increasing, so you've, you've got a limited amount of hardware and software budget, um, but find the biggest opportunities for improvement and find those self-funding self uh, uh, self activities. And it, the only way for you really to get to that 50-50 um, OPEX and CAPEX or OPEX and value-added innovation kind of, kind of mix is to be a a ruthless follower of uh, technology innovation. I mean, it, you cannot stand still. I, the, the most dangerous assumption you can make is, is that everything's fine. And I think if you, if you assume everything's fine, you're falling behind. So you need to continuously drive improvement in your infrastructure. And I think, be it infrastructure or operations, practices, those, you'll get there, but you have to make a conscious decision to say, we're not going to just sit on some piece of hardware or some piece of technology for five years. We're going to ruthlessly, ruthlessly improve our, our infrastructure mix and our operations mix. Brandon McCauley, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We'd like to do another segment with you as a, as a wealth of great. knowledge. We'd love really to great. talk to the folks in the trenches, making it happen. Certainly we'll be here from IBM and what they're uh, putting together on their portfolio. But to hear it in action is really what it's all about. This is why we have theCUBE here. Appreciate your time. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.